People have been talking about a possible World War III for decades. During the Cold War between Russia and the US, World War III was on the brink of becoming a reality. Fast forward 60 years to now, and we're back on the brink of a possible third world war. Except this time, advanced nuclear technology means we're in a whole different playing field. Today we're looking at how the threat of nuclear World War III is impacting the car industry right now. We'll look at how much the car manufacturer makes when a consumer buys a car, and the first jobs car companies will cut if we do end the nuclear war. I'll also tell you which car companies are at risk of going bankrupt in the next two years. Stay tuned because the list might surprise you. The global pandemic changed the car industry. Factories, showrooms, and dealerships shut down in an instant. U.S. car sales plummeted 40% in a month. In Chicago, L.A., and Atlanta, traffic went down 70%, and many people liked it. Now we survived the pandemic, and everyone's trying to return back to normal. When car factories reopened their doors, they were met with shortages of key parts and labor, and consumers were met with disappearing cars. In 2021, there were about a million less vehicles than normal on dealer lots, and we're still seeing parts and car shortages today. At the same time, demand for consumer electronics shot up, and so did demand for semiconductor chips. That's one of the reasons why the car industry has been suffering from a shortage of semiconductor chips. This year in 2022, car prices have been at record-breaking all-time highs because of high demand and global shortage of computer chips. With car prices as high as they are now, how much profit are car makers making from them anyway? Most consumers think that car manufacturers get between 10 to 20 percent on every new car they make. The truth is, it really depends on the main manufacturer and the model. The top premium brands make around 20% in profit. Porsche is considered by most analysts to be the car maker with the top profit margin. Porsche makes a profit around 20% or more on a model's retail price, but other brands make about 10% or lower. Now, that's not necessarily a bad profit margin. In fact, in 2020, the average profit margin for car manufacturers was only 5%, and that's after spending billions of dollars on research, develop, infrastructure, and other expenses. How expensive is it to produce a car anyway? Well, every car maker has two types of costs, fixed costs and variable costs. Fixed costs are mandatory costs that stay the same regardless of the number of cars manufactured. This includes things like the cost of maintaining a facility, finding suppliers, building and testing prototypes, training workers, and adding new tools and technology. Research and development is another important fixed cost. Every time a car maker decides to make a new model, they need to do research and development and thorough testing. In some cases, research and development can take years to complete. Research and development makes around 6% of the total production costs. In 2020, Volkswagen allocated $16.5 billion for research and development. That came out to around 7.6% of the revenue. But it's Tesla that actually spends more in research and development per car and than any other automaker by a long shot per car. Tesla spends a total of $2,984 on research and development. That comes out to three times the industry average of about 1000 bucks a car. That figure is also higher than the collective research and development budgets of GM, Ford, and Chrysler. Tesla also spends the least in advertising per car sold. And then there are variable costs. Variable costs change depending on the volume of cars produced. Raw materials, labor, and distribution are all variable costs. So if a car maker decides to produce more cars, they'll need to hire more workers and so labor costs go up. Skyrocketing oil and new raw material costs due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine is another example of the volatility of variable costs. Raw materials make up about 47% of the manufacturing cost. Steel alone can be almost 22% of a company's operational costs. Direct labor can make up about 21% of the total cost of making a car. Labor costs are usually per hour. In general, it takes about 17 to 18 hours to assemble parts of a car. And for smaller cars, the assembling process can take 11 to 12 hours. The average Ford car today sells for around $22,000. In 2017, Ford's profit margin was just around 5% before taxes. So if Ford were to sell a $22,000 vehicle, they'd make a profit of around $1,100 and a gross margin of $2,200, which in retrospect isn't as high as you may have thought initially. So let's put it all together. If there's a nuclear war, which of these expenses would car makers cut first? Since Tesla is already spending the least on advertising costs and they are at the top of the EV game, you can see that advertising costs is less of an imperative to them. If there's a nuclear war, we'll be seeing far less car ads. So if you're a car company with facilities in the country that faces war or nuclear threat, well obviously you'll consider relocating your operation to a safer, less politically volatile country. That's why Daimler, Truck, Ferrari, Ford, Mercedes-Benz, Stellantis, Toyota, Volkswagen, and Volvo has even 
are pulled out of Russia or limited their exports to Russia. Another cost that can be cut is human resources and labor costs in the event of nuclear war. It's not unheard of to see massive layoffs. And if the Russian oil sanctions have taught us anything, it's that a car company may not even have a choice on which expenses to cut. For example, say the country supplying the raw materials you need for your car is suddenly no longer an option. Even though you have the funds to buy more materials, now you've lost your supplier, so you have to find an alternative source. In the meantime, you have to figure out how to prioritize the materials you have left. Here's a question. Is it possible for a major car company to go completely bankrupt? Believe it or not, yes. It's easier to go bankrupt than you might think. Take Aston Martin, for example. Since 1913, they've gone bankrupt seven times. They first went bankrupt all the way back in 1924 when it was owned by Lionel Martin. A few bankruptcies later, the company was bought by David Brown. By 1972, David Brown was actually able to pay off all of Aston Martin's debts. But only two years later, in 1974, the company was back in bankruptcy. Or look at Lamborghini. It's been sold five times since 1963. After going bankrupt in 1978, the ownership of Lamborghini bounced around from company to company. Finally, the company was taken over by Volkswagen in 1998. Volkswagen then just placed Lamborghini under the control of the Audi Group, which gave the brand name a boost in sales they needed. Since then, Lamborghini's vehicle sales only noticeably dropped for a short time after the 2008 financial crisis. Even a singular car model itself can be enough to bankrupt the company. A case in point is the DeLorean DMC-12. It was at the height of popularity after it was featured in the cult classic movie Back to the Future. Former GM executive and engineer John DeLorean established the company back in 1975 with an investment sum of over 200 million bucks. Yet despite all that dough, DeLorean declared bankruptcy due to low demand and legal issues when its owner John DeLorean was arrested in 1982. Or take, for example, the Hummer H2. It was instantly a bestseller. At its peak, over 70,000 units were sold. Celebrities like Arnold Schwarzenegger, Eminem, and LeBron James were just some of the famous names who got a Hummer H2 of their own. But then GM Hummer's parent brand went bankrupt thanks to the 07 recession, emissions concerns, and a few bad financial decisions. By 2009, GM had completely shut down all production of the Hummer the next year. Did you know that back in March 2021, Elon Musk tweeted that Tesla and Ford are the only American companies that have not gone bankrupt out of thousands of car startups? He added that prototypes are easy to create, but production is hard, and being cash flow positive is excruciating. So, which car company will be the next on the bankruptcy radar? Car analysts say that Tesla has a less than 1% probability of bankruptcy in the next two years. But Volkswagen has a 73% chance of financial distress. And if Volkswagen doesn't experience financial troubles, then Daimler and Ford are the next expected companies with a 49% probability of financial distress. We can actually learn a few things by looking at the Vietnam War. In 1965, the U.S. officially entered the war after North Vietnam's attack on a U.S. military ship. U.S. involvement ended in 1973, and the war officially ended two years later in 1975. But the Vietnam War had a bigger impact on the U.S. economy as a whole than you might know. Factories that were producing consumer goods started to produce items and weapons for the military. And all that money was going overseas for the military that helped lower the value of the U.S. dollar. Since no corresponding money was being sent back, the U.S. economy faced a real strain. And of course, inflation only increased due to increased domestic social spending and budget deficits. Did you know that during the war, Vietnam was the most heavily bombed country in history? Over 6.1 million tons of bombs were dropped. In comparison, some 2.1 million tons of bombs were dropped in World War II. Along with millions of deaths, the Vietnam War also caused a world of trouble for the car industry. For example, after 114 years in the industry, U.S. automaker Studebaker went bankrupt and closed their doors in March 1966. But the Hummer is a different story. The car actually traces its roots back to just after the Vietnam War. After the war, the U.S. military ditched the Jeep as their go-to vehicle. Jeeps no longer had the power the military wanted, and they also had no armor. So in the 1980s, the U.S. military started looking for a more heavy-duty option. Pentagon gave AM General a billion-dollar contract to develop the fleet of high-mobility, multi-purpose wheeled vehicles to transfer troops and cargo. These were eventually known as Humvees. Mobilization is when a country organizes and assembles its military resources for a particular objective, like a special military operation or war. There are various nuances of it, and you can call it conscription or military drill. But pretty much, we're talking about gathering people and supplies. Here in the U.S., conscription is a decision that's made by Congress and the President. When you get drafted, you are legally required to serve in the military. Historically speaking, here in the United States, Americans were conscripted during the American Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War I, World War II, the Korean War, and also the Vietnam War. As little as 10% of drafted soldiers made up the force in the Civil War. Around 50% of American soldiers who fought in the First and Second World War were drafted. Compare that to one-third of Americans who were drafted into the 
Korean War and one fifth who were drafted into the Vietnam War. There was also something in the US that was known as Selective Training and Service Act. During 1940 all the way to 1973 under this act, men were drafted to fill spots in the US Armed Forces that were empty due to insufficient number of volunteers. This act applied in terms of peace or conflict. But once 1973 came about under President Nixon, the US government decided to end active conscription. Instead, signing up for the military became completely voluntary. So does that mean that military conscription is over for good? Well, no. Conscription is still technically in place on a contingency basis. Every single documented or undocumented male in the U.S. right now, including immigrants who are 18 to 25, are required to register with the Selective Service System known as the SSS. The SSS is an independent agency of the U.S. government that keeps information about every U.S. citizen or resident who can potentially be conscripted. And under Article 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution and 10 U.S. Code Number 246, U.S. federal law provides for the compulsory conscription for militia service for men between 17 and 45 years old and even certain women. But let's jump back to the current condition in the Ukraine. Now we all know about US sanctions on Russian banks, investments, businesses, oil and more ever since Russia invaded Ukraine back in February 2022. To put it in perspective, last year, that is before the war, the US imported some $18 billion worth of mineral, fuels, oil and distillation products from Russia. But then came Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And sanctions changed everything. Yet despite current sanctions, the US still depends on Russia for other things. For example, the most common products and Imported from Russia before the Ukrainian invasion included mineral fuels, I'm talking about $13 billion worth, and $2.2 billion worth of precious metals and stones, including platinum, $1.4 billion worth of iron and steel, $963 million worth of fertilizers, and $763 million worth of inorganic chemicals. But here's where things could get worse, and it has to do with NATO. Now I'm talking about the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. In 1949, NATO was founded by 12 countries, Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, the United Kingdom, and the US. Today NATO has 30 members. Right now, NATO has been avoiding joining the Ukraine war. This past September, Russia installed officials in Ukraine to stage referendums. Basically, they asked the people in four Russian-occupied parts of Ukraine to vote on whether they want to remain with Ukraine. Ukraine or join Russia. Russia claims that the people in these parts want to join Russia. The Western nations are denouncing this as a sham referendum, and the UN says that the referendums were organized in violation to the UN Charter and therefore it's illegal under international law. There's speculation that Ukraine might possibly hold its own referendum to see if certain parts want to join Poland or Romania. Let me explain. Poland joined NATO in 1999, and Romania joined NATO in 2004. So if parts of Ukraine were to vote in favor of joining Poland or Romania, they would effectively be adopted by these countries. And if Poland or Romania were to adopt these parts of the Ukraine, these two countries would in effect be obligated to protect it under the newly adopted land and people. And remember, these two countries are members of NATO. And would now this mean that NATO would need to get more actively involved in the Ukraine war? So just imagine you are Ukraine for a second. You're facing the threat of losing your entire country to Russia. And your only option, other than fighting, is to become allies with another country. But right now, countries like the UK, Germany, France want nothing to do with directly joining the war. Their way of helping Ukraine is to supply arms. So now, if you're Ukraine, you're left with two options. Surrender to the Russians or join another country. When you look at history, this isn't a stretch. Actually, not many people know this, but Ukraine used to be part of Poland way longer than it used to be part of Russia. So imagine any parts of Ukraine are joining Poland isn't that far of a stretch or a cultural shock. Now, NATO still has no plans or desire to join the war directly. But if this referendum or scenario ends up actually happening and parts of Ukraine were to join the NATO countries, like Poland or Romania, this may critically push NATO to join the war. What next? Well, to answer that, we have to go all the way back to the reason why Putin invaded Ukraine in the first place. In a 5,000 word essay on the Kremlin's website, Putin claimed that Russia and Ukraine were one people. And he further claimed that Ukraine didn't exist as a separate state and that it was a never a nation to begin with. Once Putin put his words into action and invaded Ukraine, this left many people wondering if Putin will also try to reassemble all the countries that used to be part of the old Soviet Union. But here's the thing, some former Soviet countries like Latvia and Lithuania are now a part of NATO. So if the war comes to a NATO country like Poland, what would stop Putin from attacking other ex-Soviet countries that are now part of NATO? Ukrainian President Zelensky has already repeatedly called on NATO 
NATO to enforce a no-fly zone over the Ukraine. But NATO leaders have so far decided that a direct confrontation with Russia like this would be too high of a risk to take presently. Then there's Article 5 in the North Atlantic Treaty. Any NATO member can invoke Article 5 to call for support from fellow NATO members. So far in history, this article has only been used once. It was actually used by the U.S. after the infamous 9-11 terrorist attacks in New York and Washington, D.C. But here's the thing. Article 5 is not an automatic guarantee that every NATO country will send soldiers to assist in the event of attack. What Article 5 does say is that military action is an option for the alliance's collective defense. But if this article is invoked by a NATO country like Poland, public statements from Westminster have left many expecting the U.K. to honor their obligation to join the fight. If NATO does end up joining the war, what does it mean for the U.S.? Well, the U.S. is a NATO country, so it would automatically become involved. So will there be a draft here in the United States? We don't know for sure, but what we do know is that NATO is committed to a peaceful resolution of disputes. But if diplomatic efforts don't work, they have the military power to undertake what they call crisis management operations. An attack against one NATO ally is an attack against all of them. So we can't deny the possibility of the U.S. enforcing a draft if NATO gets involved. Just look look back at the Vietnam War, for example. It started in 1954, and the war involved the communist government of North Vietnam versus South Vietnam as its principal ally, the United States. In the 1950s, there were less than 800 U.S. troops deployed in South Vietnam, but by 1962, there were over 9,000 troops. Despite lots of anti-war sentiment in the U.S., in July 1965, President Lyndon Baines Johnson authorized an immediate dispatch of 100,000 troops, and then he authorized another dispatch of 100,000 troops in 1966. In some 35,000 protested against the Vietnam War. Between July 1966 and December 1973, more than 503,000 U.S. military personnel deserted the Army. Ultimately, over 58,000 Americans were killed in the Vietnam War. After American troops returned home from 1973, America learned that we had spent more than $120 billion to help with the conflict in Vietnam. This led to mass inflation that only got worse during the worldwide oil crisis in 1973 with skyrocketing fuel prices. Russian mobilization has already had a major impact on the car industry because of the sanctions on Russian crude oil. There were shortages across the globe. Gas prices spiked, and so did car prices. When Russia first invaded Ukraine, multiple car companies like Ferrari, Stellantis, and Ford refused to conduct further business with Russia. Other companies pulled out due to parts shortages and low stock of tech equipment needed for the vehicles. Several weeks ago, another car brand was potentially added to that list, Mazda. In 2021, Mazda sold 30,000 cars. But the Japanese brand apparently wanted to end vehicle production at its joint venture plant in Vladivostok the previous March 2022. Mazda announced they'd be ending exports of parts to the Russian plants and that would end production after stocks ran out. And then Toyota announced they'd end their car production in Russia because of the interruption of key materials and parts supplies. But look, it's not just car companies that are pulling out of Russia. The war is impacting global output. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development announced that by the end of 2023, Russia's war in Ukraine will cost the global economy $2.8 trillion in economic output. Just look at Twitter and Elon Musk. Rumors say that Elon Musk initially backed out of the Twitter deal because of the possibility of Russian mobilization and nuclear threats. So you can see that conflicts and wars really push corporations to react and change their strategy. Let's face it, war is risky in business, look at the dollar impact. Just look at Google. Back in May 2022, Google's Moscow-based subsidiary announced plans for bankruptcy. The reason? Russia's seizure of its assets made it impossible for Google to operate in that country. On top of that, Google confirmed that they moved most of their employees out of the country. But war doesn't always lead to bankruptcy. It can also take the other route. During the Vietnam War, many American companies actually profited from the Vietnam War immensely. Even some that were initially heading toward bankruptcy. Logically, the companies that do well during wartime are those that develop weapons, aircraft, and chemicals. But you know, the worst energy crisis in decades is currently happening across the globe. Expanding natural gas infrastructure is not cheap, and you need to invest in it for years before seeing any major results you can actually use. Suppliers are unlikely to have the capacity to increase gas flow to Europe to an equal or high volume to replace Russian gas that was lost. The worst case scenario for companies would be the mass shutdown of any manufacturing industries that rely the most on natural gas. In the UK, Czech Republic, and Germany, people have already begun and protesting exorbitant electricity bills. If things don't get better soon, expectations are that public protest will only get worse. 
But now you tell me, do you think NATO or the US will be pulled into the war? Please share by commenting below. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for your support.